Welcome back to The Breakfast. Well, it's time for our hot topic. And today we'll be having one hot topic, one very hot topic. Um, and uh, we have as our guest to discuss this very hot topic, Mr. Abraham Great, public affairs analyst, who's joining us from Canada. Good morning, Mr. Great. Good morning to you. Thank you for having me once again. How are you doing? I'm actually fantastic. It is working. Oh, good. I'm just, I'm just playing around with your, uh, your, your name. It's great to have great on the program. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, wow. great, it's great to have great on the program today. Welcome. It's also great to, to, to be with you. <laughs> yeah, so Mr. Great, 19 days from now, we'll be having a new president mm. in Abuja. And uh, that's uh, amid petitions at the presidential election tribunals. Um, what should Nigerians be expecting is one of the things we'll be taking a look at today. Also, we want to be taking a look at the impact and changes that the Electoral Act 2022 has brought to our polity and democracy. So let's start with the impact and the changes that this new Electoral Act, the amended Electoral Act, has brought to the, to, to the fore this time around. I think, um, well, I, I would think one of the major premise of the, uh, or the, what necessitated the uh, amendment of the Electoral Act, which has led to the uh, 2022 Electoral Act, is the digitalization of our voting, voting system. That's why we had to upgrade from the Electoral Act of 2010 into uh, the Electoral Act of 2022. Now, um, we have made a lot of progress in terms of legislature uh, and, you know, uh, uh, you know um, policies under the Ninth uh, Assembly, particularly towards the end of the administration. A lot of progress is made because every country that is going to move forward has to actually have policies that are in, in, in vogue, uh, you know, policies that are current or policies that, you know, meet the needs of its people. However, saying that, we still see from the aftermath of the election that there are, you know, lacunas or there are, there are loopholes still. Even in that uh, electoral act, uh, particularly for me, the session that has to do with, uh, you know, consequences of election mark practices like looking from session 126, you know, downward. There seems to be consequences, but for me, a lot of those consequences seems just repeated from the previous Electoral Act or, you know, not really serious repercussion, 500,000 for somebody, uh, you know, uh, that breach election, or, uh, election laws. You know, those seems to me not to be stringent, um, you know, uh, policy enough. But again, this give rooms, this last election give rooms again, uh, for the legislature to look into the Electoral Act. So for me, I see a lot of progress that have been made uh, in having a new Electoral Act. However, you could see the big gap of what we had, particularly with the Section 134 of that Electoral Act, where we're having, is it in conjunction, is it this, is it, is it that? Even though there are case law, that you know can justify one position or the other you know the 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 the, the electoral act needed to be more explicit you know i would have interpreted that section to mean that um by by the by the by that policy saying in one subsection that you make 25 percent in you know two third of the state and the fct i would have thought you know but that is not the final because we'll wait for the court to interpret as uh, as needed but from my own uh, legal background i would have thought that if fct was so important then it would reflect on the nigerian constitution that abuja has a special electoral college status but because nigeria does not have such status in any part of the country you know carrying more weight than the order then if that was at the, been the case, my simple interpretation was that instead of it to be an addendum or a joiner or a conjunction to a subsection of the law, it would have been 134C rather than be part of B. So, but then I am not the judge and I'm not, uh, I don't have that legal, uh, uh, you know, fine, <laughs> 
finalism or so to, to determine what the interpretation of that law is. But literally to mean the law, that is what it would mean, you know. Okay, well, still talking about the effect of this ele electoral act, and one of it is the electronic um, transmission of results. Um, let's look at the, the, the ruling, the judgment that was given yesterday by the Supreme Court um, in the Ocean State governorship election, where part of what was said is that the transmission of results via Beavers uh, is not the only way to decide a winner. Respond to that for us, if you would. Okay, so, I, I mean, that judgment actually excites me or probably would excite my mom more uh, as, you know, uh, a relative is, 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 you know, celebrating and dancing now. And, you know, it's one that I did, I have not really fully read the, uh, I was just following Twitter feeds uh, because, because of the fact that I know that a little bit uh, is, is so concerning to my mom, I didn't want to go into it emotionally and thinking that we should be celebrating victory. But it's a very, very important um, precedence that has been laid yesterday. And that here, the interpretation for me is in the same alignment with what I've thought since that election tribunal started. And what I think the law is saying or what the Supreme Court is saying is that, look, it is not IREF that gives the final result of what election is. The final result of the election is, are supposed to be under beavers. And what that judgment is saying, in my understanding of it, even though I've, you know, I've not looked at it pedantically, is that, look, election results are already collated from each polling unit to the collation centers, and that uh, uh, you know, party agents and party representatives already have those results. And so if we are going to take anything in the court, we will be relying more on the beavers, what on the beavers, the accredited votes on the beavers, rather than relying on the IREF. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So that is a very powerful judgment that could mean a very serious precedence for the uh, upcoming election. But in law, you cannot interpret literally and just think because one case has been um, decided in this way, you know, it's definitely going to be that way. Then we don't need to go to court then if we all have the answers already. But this gives us room to study that case uh, a lot more. And, you know, I wouldn't expect anything because I think already we can see the direction that the presidential election um, petitions are already going as well. Okay. Uh, but how would you uh, say, how would you rate um, how much this uh, electoral act, which you are applauding as the game changer in this 2023 election, how would you say it has worked? Is it playing out the way you hoped it was going to play out or there's something else that is missing? Because if there is no difference between this election that happened in 2023 with the Electoral Act of 2022 uh, from what has been happening before now, then it makes no sense. So how would you rate the performance, as it were, of the Electoral Act in the 2023 election, both presidential and uh, gubernatorial elections? Like, like I said, I, I don't think it's a perfect act yet uh, because there are still, you know, there are still rooms for a lot of improvement. Well, one big thing that this has, uh, you know, has changed in the like, Nigerian electoral system is one major problem that we have had since 1959 which is the ambiguity around our sensors, our voting numbers from different regions in the country. In that, in this case now, even though it has started since 2004, uh, 2015 election, we have now seen electronic voting to be a, a more, it's more consequential to the outcome of our election. So you see example, for example, you know, we have about 90,000 or uh, 90 million plus voters. And right now is the first election in Nigeria, I mean, the lowest turnout. 
Now, that is only not only because people did not come out. There are a lot of ambiguity that has been complained of since 1959 census that the British con conducted before we had the, in the, the independence. So it has always appears that there are some ambiguous numbers that comes from certain uh, uh, quarters of the country that this last election seems to be telling us. In fact, if you are looking at it literally, it's very difficult for you to assume and think that APC played a game and they rigged. The way the dynamics of this election, it is too peculiar for you to just blanket, unless you are actually being emotional, for you just to be saying, oh, they rigged it, what have you. It doesn't appear so. It appeared to be an, a very, very real, maybe there are some suppression or what have you in areas, you know, all over the world, people do things, they propaganda, they push an area, they, in fact, in some cases, they cause traffic. It happens everywhere in the world. So for me, it's not a final, you know, uh, document, but it has made a huge difference. Okay. Uh, we understand that Libora Osoma has just uh, joined us. Uh, good morning, Mr. Osoma. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, very good. Good morning. Good morning to you. It's Oshoma. Oshoma, not Oshoma. Oshoma, yes, I corrected it a second time. Oshoma. Okay, um, well, uh, let's start from, um, from uh, Oshun State. Adeleke has been declared by the Supreme Court as the authentic winner of that election. And then there are some things that came out of that. We were just discussing uh, with uh, Abraham Great right now. Um, what pronouncements were made. We hear or we understand that one of the things that were, was, was said was that um, uh, elections do not have to be... Uh, the beavers is the not beavers the only means. is not the only which, means. Yeah, by the results can be declared. Beautiful. So what do you see? Because, let me not even say that. Some people feel that this is just a pointer to what the the possible outcome of the presidential elections petitions uh, is going to be. What is your response to that? Yeah, uh, quickly, let's start from um, the representative, the council that um, argued this matter. If you look at um, the theme of, um, uh, what do you call it, um, Adeleke, uh, Adeleke's theme is uh, almost replicated in Obi and Atiku's theme. And then so you wonder the argument can pass at um, uh, by at the tribunal in Osho by this same thing, they would be canvassing the opposite of that argument at the presidential election. Mm. So these are pointers, so we understand the basics. And then um uh, the last thing is also uh, almost replicated in um, uh, Tinubu's, uh, the APC, uh, the, uh, the presidential candidate team at the presidential election. So the argument canvas in Osho, they will be canvassing the opposite of it. And so that's why, you know, when you say a pointer, you know, and then the pronouncement of the tribunal, these are, are elementary issues that, you know, we have been blinded by sentiment to. Um, the Electoral Act is very clear, which INEC had consistently repeated on um, how election results are collated and announced. So even though um, a lot of people had consistently maintained, I ah, know the moment Divas was introduced, every other process should be jettisoned. The Electoral Act did not jettisoning all other processes. What the Electoral Act simply did was to complement the manual process with an electronic process. Even in America, in America, there is no system that is completely electronic. They still also, you know, have mailing ballots, you know, and all, all of that. So that's basically what the Supreme Court had there, reiterated. And also to add to that, um, the issues of um, before now, electoral act, uh, election practices had been proved pulling units by pulling units. And also, the discrepancies in elections, also, the Supreme Court had reiterated 
that you do the onus of proof is on the petitioner and not on the defense to establish that irregularities were not there or that they were there. So what the petitioner did in Oshun case, the case of Oshun, was to rely heavily on the results, conflicting results from the IRM. If you remember in that matter, the reports from um, uh, the IRM that was um, issued to the APC candidate was different from the report that uh, INEC attacked to their claim, uh, to their defense, and also different from the reports that was attacked to the PDP uh, uh, defense. And so the courts, in his opinion, said, look, the onus is still on you, who is a petitioner, to prove this irregularity and not to resort to the discrepancies in those reports. Ah, and if you remember, even at the open court tribunal, the tribunal, the beavers machine that were used, that were deployed in that election, were examined and tallied with the number of actual voters as against the report of the IRM. And I'm so the court, in his opinion, I said, look, you cannot pick one and and uh, whether there are discrepancies, sorry, that whether there are discrepancies, the primary source of the evidence, which is the Beavers machine, should be resorted to, and it was resorted to, and that um, the outcome is what the court has relied on. And also, the court also had not completely, because the provisions are very clear, that the voters register consistently is a document that you must reckon with. In all elections, despite the fact that I think Section 57 has said that um, the overvoting is when the number of accredited voters, a uh, number of accredited voters, number of actual voters is more than the number of accredited voters by believers. But the, the electoral act also clearly stated that you must also reckon these numbers with the number of the actual of the reg, uh, uh, registered voters as stated in the register. So all of these are what you must reckon with in determining actual voters and over voting. Uh, and so that's basically what the court um, had, um, had decided. And, and, and so it's a, um, uh, a welcome development. It's a work in progress. And what that also should tell us is that it is not just enough for us to amend our laws. It is also very germane for us to also put machineries in place to ensure the smooth administration of that law. Well, thank you, Mr. Liberos Oshama. I should establish here that he is a legal practitioner, but of course, having listened to him, you know that he is a legal practitioner. Well, I've been told that another guest has joined us, Justice Uhwebu, a human rights lawyer, has joined the conversation. Good morning, Mr. Uhwebu. Good morning. All right. Well, we're going to be talking to you mostly about the situation uh, in the Southeast and how they are playing their politics there. Ohanez Ndibo Worldwide has called for the revival of the uh, Igbo Governors Forum. Why have there not been a forum such as that active in that region? Well, uh, I, I will say that... Um it is the same politics uh, people have been playing all this while. And again, this tribalistic and regional sentiment of uh, uh, Indian Governance Forum, the Republican Governance Forum, and uh, the Northern Governance Forum. And that is one of the reasons why we will not be investment right here. And uh, especially when you even talk about the Indian Governance Forum, you will not agree with me that uh, some of them are in APC, some of them are in PD. And we have a situation in Nigeria where once you belong to a political party and another person belongs to a political party, they see themselves as enemies when it comes to principles, to play the game, when it comes to giving dividends of democracy to the people, when it comes to them enjoying themselves and attending functions, they become one. So I think they are just playing politics with the head of the people. But people, some would say that uh, Ndibo, 
not coming together, uniting as one, a, having a, a, a common uh, political front, so to speak, not having a political party, you know what I mean? Having some sort of unity amongst them, especially the leaders, is the bane of development in that area. They are not developing well, as they should, as a section of this country. They are not, you cannot see, uh, especially now that the APC is uh, putting together their principal officers, the Igbos are not seen to be um, given any kind of relevance. How does that strike well, you me, as an Igbo person? Yeah. yeah, for me, I think it's an issue of uh, uh, individual understanding and the selfishness. Because um, you cannot tell me that because you're a member of PDP, and this person is a member of APC, and this person is a member of ABGA or a member of Labour Party, that you people should not work together in order to make sure that the well-being of the people, especially in that region, is first and paramount in your mind. Let me give you an example. For example, when Fayoshi was a uh, governor of a uh, state, Fayoshi was governor on that thing. Before she was also attending functions called by uh, by the Eurobars, and we are other governors from APC we are attending. And Fayoshi was also doing one or two things for the state, not minding that he's from uh, PDP party and others. So I think... Uh, Yes, I, you might be a little bit right that the Igbos are not united or something like that. But I have to tell you that it's out of selfishness. Because this is the only region where I see when people come together as a people, they not talk about personal interest and personal gain. Because I don't see anything, any reason why it should be so. Let me give you a typical example. I once attended the forum of the Igbos. I, 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 I gave them a piece of advice. That we don't need federal government to dredge the Niger for us. We don't need federal government to build the second Niger bridge for us. The people, people governors can come together and you know contribute and do it, or even invite a multinational company. Uh, Fashola did it in Lagos State. So what are we talking about today? When Fashola left, is it Lagos State that is ripping? Is it Fashola that is ripping the fruit or or or, or, or negotiations? So it's a thing of selfish interest as far as I'm concerned. Let me bring in uh, Mr. Leverus uh, Oshama. Mr. Leverus Oshama. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, let's have your thought on the kind of politics, the brand of politics the Igbos have been playing, uh, especially since 1999. Let's have your thought on it. Yeah, uh, first and foremost, I want to say that um, this call also is a pointer to the fact that um, Nigeria can only survive on region. Uh, this idea of having, you know, a, 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 a behemoth called the federal government um, and uh, the belief that the federal government would do everything for us, it's um, an aberration, a misplaced priority. The federal government can only do the limited it has consistently done. The only way we can develop as a people is if we go back to our region. And that's why you find out that even among lawyers, you have um, the Edbe, uh, um, uh, uh, what you could you call them, Nadi, uh, Edbe Amofin, which is uh, the Western uh, uh, lawyer's body. You have um, the Eastern, uh, um, um, uh, what do you call it, the, the Eastern uh, uh, block. You have the Midwestern region and all of that. These are ways countries are consistently have developed. And I'm so I also welcome the idea of having the not just um, um, uh, what do you call it uh, the uh, Southern Governors Forum, but also having the Eastern Governors Forum, the Western Governors Forum, you know, and all of that. But it shouldn't be for jamboree or for cake sharing. It should be for development. I have consistently talked about Abia State, for example, and how. Governors has taken back, you know, waters in that place. And also this issue of sit at home in, in the entire Eastern region, for example, have consistently undermined business development in those places. I used to go to Oweri a lot, uh, even though I'm not from there. I, I, I have a lot of friends from there. I used to go to Oweri. But when the insecurity started, I stopped going because, um, you know, this sit at home and all of that has a way of also, you know, undermining business activities and nobody there talked about it. And now coming to the issue of development and the uh, power sharing, 
it is not a novel thing the way politics is played in Nigeria that the winner always want to take it all. Um, going by the last election, we also know where the uh, vote from the East went to. And so it is also germane for people who gave vote APC to say, look, we should get positions first than areas that didn't give them vote. This is where people talk about not putting all your eggs in one basket. In uh, 2015, it happened. Um, also, it is happening now. I think it also happened to the West in um, 2011, 20, 2011 up to 2015, where the Eurobars complained that they didn't, even though they frustrated the effort of the PDP-led government then to appoint uh, or to gift the West um, its speakership of the House of Assembly and the person of Monica at, uh, Akonde. But they also complained. But what did they do? When they complained, they governized and created an alliance with, you know, some political parties from the north and uh, a slice from the east to form the APC and they won election. So, so this should also be a wake-up call for politicians from the east. And like Justice has said, not just for selfish reasons, not for banters or not for sharing money, but for the development of the entire eastern region. And then once you start, once you begin to showcase, you know, a good governance, Naturally, people will gravitate towards the political party. Like it happened in Lagos. I can tell people for sure that it is the activities of Fashola in Lagos that made people saw the SPN as, an, as a credible alternative. That was what even led to the Oshomole government, the fire me in Ekiti, and subsequently the Arabe Shola in Osho. You know, because... Uh, 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 Fashola's administration was hailed by almost everybody as something different and, and new from what the PDP government was then. I hope and I pray that um, somebody like my very good friend, um, the elected governor, uh, governor-elect in Abia State, um, uh, Alex Oti, we use that as a, as a, 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 a stepping stone to kickstart development in Abia and then use that opportunity to showcase you know, a brand new country <laughs> and a brand new style of politics in the East. Okay, uh, let me go to uh, Abraham Great. You've been waiting for a very long time. Um, we are talking about a new era. We're talking about a, a new psyche for the Nigerian people. But uh, having a new era, new psyche for our people, they need to know the things that they, they can contribute as well to making Nigeria great because we've been relying on the government all the time. So for us to get the kind of Nigeria of our dream, as a people, not necessarily the government now, what do you think we should start looking at to change or to do better to make Nigeria as great as we want it to be? Uh, thank you. I think I'll take it uh, from the last questions that my uh, co-panelists are uh, you know, debating in terms of how the East you know, plays the election. We have to be able to understand that we need to uh, redefine our beginning. You know, almost like 1999 was a new beginning, the Fourth Republic. But we have to go back to why are we in this way where the East, you know, are voting in their own way and what have you. We have to go back to the fact that this country was regional before it was put together, before the amalgamation. So the, the differences, we haven't really sought out the, the, the issue of our differences. And we saw that through the system of governance that we had before the, uh, before the independence, the unitary system. We saw that in the kind of politics that in Amdi Azikwe, you know, Awolowo, Awolowo was suggesting before we went with, with the federal system that we should have six regions. That's what we're doing now, you know, uh, in terms of how we describe our area, south, 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 east, southwest. And the man was suggesting at the time that, look, let's make this country more like a parliamentary system where each of the region will be like Scotland, England, Northern Ireland, and each of them will have their own constitution or unwritten constitution and will operate by their own codes. Now, that is again at the back end of what then happened in the 1960s, the war. So the Southeast have not fully recovered from this. And I'm going to say this, that if we're going to be better as a nation, there has to be a, a, there, there has to be a committee of national unity 
almost similar to what we have in the comfort, but the comfort was There's more no need for about structuring the country. Uh, hello? <laughs> Oshoma, oh, so, you agree with you on that? Go on. Huh? Oshoma, uh, yeah, so, hold on. Let him finish, then you, you respond to what he said. No, no, no. Just a side comment. I, I'm not... Uh, sorry. Go ahead, Grace. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, okay, so I'll let others weigh in. But uh, my, my belief is that... It, I mean, it is very possible. America had this... For, for many decades, where the East is having problem with the South and power never went to the South for, for I mean, considerable number of years. But they were eventually able to overcome this thing by, you know, having dialogues, having caucuses, discussing issue. The South, the East, the West, the North would need to come together at some point and rethink, and each region Elders need to come together and say, how we play politics needs to change. If there's anything that I learned, you know, from some part of the country, is the fact that you see that many part of the country, like the western part of the country, the little of the history that I know there, they've had several wars. They've had many wars that have separated them. But at some point, they have come together as a unit that you almost could not tell the difference between a kitty and, uh, and Oshu and what have you. I mean, I, I grew up that way. Either it's religion or what have you. You see that we are both Christian and Muslim in this family, but we're still one. Even though we still have a war in that part of the, uh, in the Southwest, that's the Modakeke and Ileife war. But that is also more political. So I think we can actually come to the point where the, every part of the country can begin to see each other uh, as one nation. I think it is possible when we decide uh, to do that. So our mindset needs to change. That's one area that we need to. And if, on a final note, if, if I may say, one other area that we need to change is that we need to come to this uh, mindset or uh, come up the mindset where we think that government should do everything. I blame government that they have not even attained the main thing yet, according to my slow hierarchy of need, where the physiological need in the country is not even met yet. So I can understand why people are overly reliant. But at some point, we need to break off from our dependency on most of which local government, state government should do, and expecting that it's a president that must fix every problem in, uh, in the country. We need to go back to America and remember what they did when they were in poverty. The tycoons, people like uh, J.C. Morgan, people like John D. Rockefeller, these people started industry, and this has already begun in Nigeria. And we need to change our mindset and see that we are on a trajectory into something big as a nation. A huge lack of social capital is a major problem we're having in the country. Uh, let me take you, go back to Justice Uwebu. How would you suggest that we build social capital in this country? 62 years after independence. Well, right. Well, yeah. Go on, yes. I'm Hello, saying, how do we build... Well, well as, far as, I'm, as, as far as I'm concerned, there's something I keep on saying every time. Sincerity of purpose. And that is what I don't see in our so-called leaders today. Because if going by uh, our history since independence, and we are still here now, talking every day, I keep on wondering... When we were in school, in economics, we were talking about what we call a lot of geometric progression and a lot of diminishing return. And I believe every Nigerian will agree with me today that what we're experiencing in this country is diminishing return. And we're not progressing. We're not, we're not going up at all. In year, in year out, okay, look at it. Every four years we conduct an election is one ill or the other from the umpire. They are, we are not growing, rather we are going down. But every day they go outside, we come here and talk, we say everything, we see all these things, and nobody wants to do the right thing. Why? Because of selfishness and impunity. Because the executive itself has almost taken everything, feeling that nothing will happen. But actually nothing will happen. Nobody is talking about development. Nobody is talking about infrastructure. Nobody is talking about education. Nobody is talking about anything. Just like my friend said, we, we need to redefine ourselves and agree at this thing. The only thing that can save this country is regional government. And if it cannot work, let us see a way to go about this. It's not a do or die affair that everybody should be together in the first place. If it's not working, we should look for something to do. We should at this point begin to tell ourselves the truth. 
My friend was talking about America. And you remember that the United States you are referring to, every state has its own laws, and they are operating with that. But in Nigeria, is there anything like that? People are always looking at the federal government because the federal government is, takes everything. They give little to the people. Look at what we are talking about today. Today, we are talking and debating about local government autonomy. Are we supposed to be talking about that? Today, look, the federal government now sends money to the states, and the states sends to local government, and look, the states hijack the money and give the local government a little, forgetting that these are even the people that are close to the, to the government, are something that is close to the people. Was it like this before? The 1979 Constitution wasn't like this and all the rest. So we got all this in because we now have selfish people and wicked people in politics that, has, that claim to be leaders. Everybody now is acquiring, acquiring, acquiring. That is just what is happening to us today. Okay, well, the implementation of critical macroeconomic and structural policy reforms uh, by the newly elected government can place the economy on a stronger and more sustainable path. Uh, the questions now are, what are these critical microeconomic uh, uh, structures and uh, policies that this new government should put in place to move this country forward? Because whether we like it or not, we are one as it is. And, um, but what do we do going forward as we look at this issue of expectations from the new government? Let me start with you, uh, Liberus. Yeah. <laughs> First and foremost, let me say here that um, I do not agree that we need a government of national unity or a, a, a national forum or whatever. And so that's why I was laughing. I, I want to disagree with my brother on that. Um, if you do your own bit and I do my own bit, government will grow organically. Um, and so that's why I believe that the problem of Nigeria is Nigerians not even government, Nigerians, because everybody in government today was once critical of previous governments. Ask Alajilai Mohammed. I remember how vociferous he was, you know, how things can be done better. I remember Festus Keyamu. I remember Ruben Abati. I can name, call names for you. Even people like Gulag Jonathan, when they probably were not in government, they knew how government should run. People like Bola Ahmed Tinubu today, even uh, uh, President Buhari, when he was not in government, he knew our government should run. But the moment he stepped in, and every Nigerian knows how government should be until you give them our opportunity. Just give a Nigerian small uniform, small uniform. You begin to hear, do you know who I am? You know? So, dare to hire an artisan, artisan, to fix your bob for you. A bob that is sold for maybe 200 naira, you will come back and tell your guys 500 naira. Things don't cost for market. So, that is the problem. That's the attitude. That's the mentality. So, that person gets into government office, he continues with that mentality, forgetting that he was once critical. So, what do we need? All these macroeconomics, microeconomics, and all of these are jargons. If the right structure is not in place, when Bola Ahmed Tinubu and the APC team were in FPN, as justice is there, we were both sympathetic to the ideas and the ideologies that they canvassed. Then, how government should run, how we should ensure that government at the local uh, level, which is the 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 um, machinery that should galvanize the people should be put in place, and that once the governance is the structure of governance is right, every other thing can now begin to we can now begin to put every other thing in place. You cannot have a behemoth called the federal government who operates as a local government in a, a large landmass like Nigeria and expect that you will touch every nook and cranny. It is not possible. So, and that's why all this macro, micro economy, who are going to be the drivers? Remember, let me take your mind back why it will fail if the structure is not addressed. APC Buhari administration said they were going to create job in uh, 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 770 
seven local governments, uh, 777,000 jobs per annum. And Festus Kiamu, Minister for State for Labor, came up with a wheelbarrow, um, uh, what do you call it, job uh, uh, creation. And at the end of the day, it ended up as it started. People said it was fraud. Some persons just used it as a platform to make money for themselves. Do you know why? Because it wasn't driven by the local government. You don't need to have a federal government job creation at that level. Once the structure is right, the local government will begin to create jobs. I, am, I just came back from, from Canada. I was in the state of Ontario. You do not need, you are practicing law in the state of Ontario. You don't need to go and pay license in Abata for you to practice in Ontario. If you pay license in Abata, you practice law in Abata. So it's the same thing. The state of Ontario provides for the people in Ontario. It is the same thing with America. So here, we are talking about a Nigeria where the federal government wants to provide for Arugungu local government in Sokoto, wants to provide for uh, Esako central local government in Edo, wants to provide for Agadir local government in, in uh, uh, Lagos, wants to provide for Udubari local government in, in Calabar, and at the same time provide for um, uh, what you call the local government in Benue. It is not possible. It is the people in Ogbadibo that understand that peculiarity. What they need might not be what the man in Anegbete in Isako Central needs. So that's why what we need is to ensure that people that have consistently clamor and campaign for a restructuring of this country are now at the hands of affairs. I had expected that they would begin to discuss a total overhauling of our structure, our defective structure, so that governance can be put in the right perspective, can be pigeonholed, so that I don't need to go to Abuja to begin to look for the dividends of democracy. I don't need to wait for Minister for Works to tie the road in a movie that takes that goes from a movie to a half year in um, uh, Arochuku in Abia State. The people and the government in that place understands it, feel the pain, and know when to do it. Until we do that, all this, and that way, the funds used in those places will be localized, and local business activities will thrive. But when you are waiting for go federal government presence, they start from Sokoto, the people in uh, Abia will complain. You start from Benue, the people in Calabar will complain. You start from Lagos, those in Oshu will complain. So that's why let's government share its weight and redistribute these responsibilities. And then those of us who are a critical of government can now begin to look at them, you know, local government by local government, and not to begin to consistently look at the president. With that, who becomes, with the emphasis, who becomes the president, and look more at who becomes our governor, who becomes our local government chairman, who becomes our councillor, and then tax them on dividends of democracy properly. Until we do all of this, my, 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 my sister, we will just be deceiving ourselves on macroeconomic, microeconomics, and, you know, nothing will move. But so that it does not look as if I avoided your question. What we need to do now, first and foremost, what are these dividends of macroeconomy? The basic... Uh, 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 um, what do you call it? Uh, 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 tools that will drive economy. Let us fix power. If you fix power, for example, the smallest businesses in Nigeria runs on power. Let us also begin to refine our, our, our oil, where the price of the petroleum product is dependent on one federal government having to fix or or uh, uh, give subsidy, you cannot drive production that way. Now everybody is going to China to produce. We need to bring back those local production here, yeah, and then begin. Those are the small, smallest of the indices that will drive your ma ma microeconomy.
And I wish we had more time to discuss all this. Uh, but one thing we have all agreed upon is that we need a revamp of both our thinking and the way that we do things in Nigeria. And we do hope that that will come to be. And well, who else to drive this process than the people themselves? And we're hoping that Nigerians will stand up to their responsibility, hold the leaders accountable, and then suggest the things that need to be done and also show working, as we say in Nigeria. I'd like to thank you, gentlemen, for coming on the program. Ibrahim, great public affairs analyst uh, who is talking with us from uh, Canada right now, and Justice Ohuebu, human rights lawyer, talking with us from Abuja. We also have had Liboros Oshoma, legal practitioner, uh, talking to us here from Lagos. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so yeah. much. So uh, we'll take a short break now, and when we return, we'll take a peek into the world of sports. Stay with us.